All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us for the Get to Know the TPO webinar today. Um, there is a link in the chat box um, that just got posted with, with uh, It'll go to our TPO website where there's some educational materials. There's nine brochures that are kind of FAQ style um, informational uh, brochures about the TPO's work. So be sure to check those out um, after the webinar if you haven't already. Um, there's a lot of information packed in there that kind of expands upon some of the topics that we'll discuss uh, in the presentation today. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, my name is Caroline Daigle. I'm joined today by my colleague, Courtney Geary, who's going to be helping us with the um, chat box. So if you have any questions that come up um, as I'm presenting, please feel free to just enter them into the chat. I think there's chat and Q&A um, options, but either of those work. We'll be keeping an eye on both of them. Um, and then we'll be able to address questions at the end of the presentation. The presentation is only about 15 minutes, so we should wrap up. Um, well before 11.45, but there's uh, plenty of time for questions uh, after the presentation if those do come up. So um, Courtney and I work at the Regional Planning Agency, the Chattanooga-Hamilton County Regional Planning Agency, or the RPA, which you may already be familiar with, you may have heard before. And um, what you may not know is that the RPA also staffs an organization called the Chattanooga-Hamilton County North Georgia Transportation Planning Organization, which we know is a mouthful, um, so for short, that's called the TPO. So the goal for today's webinar is just to introduce you to the TPO, um, explain some of our major responsibilities, and discuss a few ways in which transportation planning decisions um, impact our broader community. So if you're ready to learn all about regional transportation planning, I'll jump right in. Um, at its core, transportation planning deals with thinking about how people and the things that people need get around from point A to point B. We know that people move around in different ways, including in cars, on foot, on bikes, or in buses, and all of this movement happens on streets, sidewalks, or other similar places, which are all called facilities in transportation planning speak. And the facility that's most comfortable for a person on a bike, for example, is really different than the facility most convenient for a person in a car or for someone needing to ship goods by a freight between regions. So we have to plan for all of these modes in our multimodal transportation system. If you've ever been waiting for a bus, sitting in traffic or walking along the street and wondered about the behind the scenes view on making transportation plans, then you've come to the right place. So thinking regionally is a lot of what we do in the TPO. About 50 years ago, the federal government determined that big regions need to have regional planning bodies to think about transportation because commuting patterns and traffic flows don't always match up with the political boundaries that say where the city limits at one place end and where those of another begin. The map on the screen here shows our TPO planning area. And you'll note that our TPO boundaries don't entirely follow political lines. That's because these boundaries are determined with every census and are based on how our region's population is distributed. So our TPO planning area covers all of Hamilton County, Tennessee, all of Catoosa County, Georgia, and portions of Walker and Dade counties in Georgia too, as well as 15 different local municipalities spread across these four counties. An executive board made up of elected representatives from each jurisdiction, as well as representatives from other partner agencies like CARTA, governs our work. And a technical coordinating committee made up of technical experts makes informed recommendations to our board. So you can tell from all the partners listed on the screen here that the TPO work requires a lot of coordination. Federal legislation says that the TPO is responsible for carrying out a continuing cooperative and comprehensive transportation planning process. A big part of this process is deciding how to invest funds that the federal government has set aside specifically to go towards transportation needs in our region. This really boils down to identifying and prioritizing the most needed transportation projects and then allocating the money to pay for them. So to help make these decisions, our TPO's major focus is working on these things called regional transportation plans, or for short, an RTP, that help us plan in a coordinated way for how to invest in transportation projects over the future. The RTP looks at a 20 to 25 year horizon, analyzes the current state of our transportation systems, 
projects anticipated growth and changes, and then sets goals for the future. It then allocates funds to projects from our partner jurisdictions that address the identified needs and help make progress towards achieving the region's goals. Another document called the Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, pulls out select projects from the RTP that are expected to start in the short term over a four-year horizon and shows the funds committed to their completion. So projects move from our, tip, or from our RTP into our TIP. And in our plans, this funding allocation is done through a project prioritization process that the TPO leads based on goals set for the region. Hearing from the public is a huge part of how we set these goals. When we rank projects, we use a scoring framework that allows projects of different scales, so everything from a neighborhood bike lane to an interstate interchange, to still compete for funds on an even playing field despite their scope, because projects compete based on their ability to meet the goals that they're designed for, and not based on their size or scale. Since our plans are regional, they include projects in multiple jurisdictions and they only include projects that are eligible for federal funding or that are deemed regionally significant. So filling a few potholes at the end of a neighborhood cul-de-sac isn't something that would be funded through the TPO process, but repaving an entire stretch of a major road is. And as a planning body, the TPO does not deal with implementation. So that's to say that the RTP and the TIP may show a project and the money to pay for it in a project list, but the jurisdiction and control of that project has to oversee and make decisions about the design, the contracts, and the actual construction and implementation of the work. Also, our plans project list is fiscally constrained, which is just a fancy way of saying that the funding checkbook needs to balance out at the end of the day. We can't plan to fund more projects than the expected available funds will be able to cover. Another important note about the RTP is that there are several national goals set by the Federal Highway Administration or FHWA that have to be addressed in the plan. So we're not totally left to our own devices. FHWA uses a performance-based and data-driven approach to measure progress on addressing these goals. All of the goals help us achieve the larger purpose of the transportation system, which is safely getting people and goods where they need to go. Now that we've covered some of the general scope of the, art, of the TPO's work and purpose, let's take a look at some of the hard choices and trade-offs involved in transportation planning. Generally speaking, transportation planning trade-offs involve addressing the questions, how many resources do I allocate to one goal over another? And what are the consequences of that allocation? Deciding between competing priorities and balancing different needs can be really tricky. One of the most prominent trade-offs that we have to consider is finding the balance between paying to maintain the transportation facilities that have already been built or paying to build new or expanded transportation facilities. Addressing transportation trade-offs like this involves asking tough questions that require looking at issues from many different perspectives. Another thing to consider are the competing approaches to dealing with congestion. Two of the prevailing methods are increasing capacity, this is planner speak for making a road wider by adding more lanes, or managing congestion with travel demand management or TDM strategies, which are strategies to encourage people to move around in different ways, or to manage the demand that they place on the transportation system by reducing or redistributing the number of trips that they take. Additional road capacity can ease congestion in the short term, but it's clear that this is not a long-term solution. We know we can't build our way out of congestion. TDM strategies like using transit or telecommuting are more effective in the long run if there's a true behavior shift, but it can be hard to feel the impact of this approach in the short term. So as we discussed at the beginning of the presentation, Transportation planning at its core is just about making those connections between people and the places that they need to go. This work is a fundamental part of making our communities successful and thriving places. With a new understanding of what the TPO does, let's now look at a few ways in which transportation planning decisions have an impact on our day-to-day -day lives. In the transportation planning process, 
we give a lot of thought to the economic impact of investment decisions. Economic growth, efficient freight movement, and more all depend heavily on an efficient transportation system. For goods to get from the factory where they're produced to the local store where you buy them, the freight system must operate smoothly. And access to transportation can improve economic mobility by affording people a reliable way to get to work and hold down a job. Let's now look at how transportation relates to the environment. We know that our air quality is affected by smog and emissions caused primarily by vehicles. So there's a direct connection between the number of vehicles on our roads and the air quality of our region. When we think about ways to reduce congestion, it's not just because people don't like traffic. Rather, it's also in the interest of improving our air quality. Beyond air quality concerns, transportation systems can also trigger other significant impacts on sensitive natural areas. And recognizing that climate patterns are experiencing unprecedented change, we also have to make investment decisions that plan for a resilient transportation network in an uncertain future. Transportation decisions must also be considered through the lens of social equity. Access to reliable transportation has been found to be the biggest factor in determining whether someone will avoid homelessness, for example. Recognizing realities like this means we should ensure that communities that are structurally disadvantaged have meaningful access to transportation. What's more, that negative impacts of transportation facilities have historically been disproportionately placed on communities of color and lower income communities. And as a result, there have been more frequent instances of adverse health effects like asthma borne by these communities. In transportation planning, we use an environmental justice framework as well as other equity related indicators to plan for investments that improve access for underserved populations and ensure there is no disproportionate burden on low income communities or communities of color. Finally, another relationship to consider is that between land use and transportation. Decisions about what to build where really impact the ability of our transportation system to get people to and from all of their destinations. For example, as the diagram on this slide shows, density, walkability, linearity, and proximity are all needed for public transit to work well. And these indicators are all determined in large part by the land use decisions that get made. Let's consider proximity. If destinations like home and work are 20 miles apart, then it becomes very difficult to efficiently move between those destinations in any way other than with a car. And as we discussed earlier, building and maintaining the infrastructure necessary for everyone to travel by car for all of their daily trips is a really expensive investment. And we are already seeing that there aren't enough funds to maintain what has been built to date. So transportation planning that allows for more people to move around in different ways or more multimodal access is a smart investment decision for our local economies. And this multimodal access is most feasible in areas with well-connected street networks. Street networks with high connectivity provide options for how to get from one place to the next, whereas disconnected street networks limit options and often involve long, long travel times for relatively short as the crow flies distances, like you can see from the two alternatives on this uh, slide. Disconnected street networks are also more hierarchical, meaning that they channel more traffic to fewer main roads and can contribute to what is sometimes unnecessary congestion. So while there may sometimes be community preferences for dead-end streets like cul-de-sacs, we have to balance understanding this preference with addressing what our transportation network needs in order to function as a regional system. The extent to which our streets are connected or disconnected has a really big impact on the ability for people to move around in an efficient way. And if all of that wasn't enough work already, we also have to keep a pulse on an ever-changing world and anticipate what will impact the future of transportation. Updating our long-range plans every five years helps us stay on top of these changes. For example, going into our next long range plan update, we're trying to anticipate whether the increases in telecommuting, online shopping and home deliveries seen during the COVID-19 pandemic will be sustained into the future. 
we're also trying to be prepared for understanding how new technologies like autonomous vehicles or delivery drones could have a paradigm shift on our day-to-day -day lifestyles. Thinking about all of this and more, we're putting in the work now to most strategically plan for an unknown future. So we covered a lot in this presentation, but hopefully now you have a good understanding of what the TPO does for our region. Starting next year in 2021, we're going to begin outreach for the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan or the RTP. As you now know, the RTP plans for transportation projects that will make our region more livable while ensuring our economy continues to thrive. The RTP development process does take a long time, but we want you to know about this work and know when and how to get involved. We'll be seeking input around a few major topics during the development of the RTP. First, goals and priorities for investment in the plan. Basically, you know, if it was your money, how would you spend it? What are your priorities for investing funds available for our region? And then existing conditions and kind of transportation needs, points of concern along the transportation network. Where are those bottleneck uh, points in your commute or stress points um, in your trips that you take on a daily basis. Um, and then prioritization of projects. So reviewing um, projects that are kind of on the table for consideration that would help address the goals and priorities of the region. And then finally, a full review of the draft plan. So now that you know who the TPO is and what work we do, please stay informed um, by visiting our website and attending our meetings, both our executive board meetings and our technical coordinating committee meetings are always open to the public. We really look forward to hearing from you more, especially as we approach the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan update. Um, so with that, that's the end of the presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions that anyone has right now. Um, please feel free to enter them into the chat or um, Q&A, either of those options works, or you can even um, raise your virtual hand and ask a question verbally if you find it easier to do that. Um, while People might be thinking through questions. Um, Courtney is going to put a link in the chat to a Google form that you can fill out. If you wanna stay up to date on um, what the TPO is doing as it involves the 2050 RTP, um, this is a link to a form where you can sign up for our email list. I promise we won't send um, very many emails, so please sign up for that um, so that you stay informed and know about meetings or um, virtual meetings or um, input opportunities as it relates to the 2050 plan. Um, and then also on that same um, form in the link that Courtney is going to put in the chat box, there's um, an opportunity to provide feedback on the presentation today and then on some of the topics covered in the presentation. So just some initial, you know, hey, what do you care about as it relates to transportation? We want to make sure that we're hearing that. Um, while we have the audience today and, and um, that we're able to incorporate that feedback into our planning effort that'll start next year. So please take a few minutes to fill out that form um, either after the uh, presentation today or, or later on. Um, and any other questions? Let's see if there are any questions that have come through so far. None quite yet, but I'll hang out for a few minutes in case any questions come up. Um, if you think of something after, um, like, you know, later on this week or even in a few weeks, whenever, if anything comes up, um, please just email us at tpo at chattanooga.gov and we'll be happy to uh, help you out. So um, that's information is on the screen here. And with that, we're done for, uh, for the webinar. So Thanks again for joining us and hope everybody has a happy holiday season.